first question you're having is why this specific topic? Why did I choose to talk about security design principles in the first place? The backstory basically goes like this. I had a, a online webinar in December where I talked about building a security architecture on a broader basis, basically how you can use your specific technology stack to build a framework for a secure foundation for a secure architecture. And of course, I also mentioned security design principles. And based on the feedback I got, I realized how important it is to demystify those security design principles because they are really valuable. They are really powerful if used correctly. But at many developers and at many companies, those principles there might be some of those principles present, but they are not used uh, the way they should be used. And that's why I've been talking to, to our friends at uh, SBA Research and uh, we discussed the opportunities and um, said it would be a nice topic for this meetup. And yes, today I have the chance to dig deep into this specific topic and hopefully show you how you can use such principles on your own and also give you some common examples of such principles that can be found uh, at, at different companies and are really useful to implement for yourself. Yeah, Thomas already did a great introduction. Uh, I think I can skip over this slide rather quickly. Only so much I've been working for over 20 years in the field of information security and started out as a penetration test and did a lot of security source code reviews, switched over during the last years on the defensive side. So basically I'm more focused now on, on attack prevention uh, than the, the actual attack simulation themselves and security testing. Did a lot of security um, architecture, project, secure software development, and also security requirements engineering. Yeah, and if you want to get in contact, you find my information here as well. So what are security design principles? If we take a look at the word principle, it basically says it's a rule or belief governing one's behavior. And when I take a look what we see out there in the, in the real world, at real companies, real organiza organizations, real developer teams, what I'm seeing is often some loosely collected lists of rather abstract principles that are maybe in some secure software development guideline, maybe on some uh, data store in some knowledge base where some developers maybe know that there are design principles, but most don't. And these developers who know about them don't really use, uh, really know how to use them. And uh, that's of course a problem because those design principles are basically high level concepts that should guide your security design decisions. And if they are just uh, some, yeah, loosely and hard, loosely collected and hard to understand names in a list, they definitely won't guide your uh, behavior. So I use this comparison quite often, but it's, it, I think it really drives home the point I want to make. Let's, lay, let's take a look at an example, some other group of people who have really strong principles, some really strong beliefs. Let's take a look at vegetarians or vegans. When a person decides to go vegan, chances are the day this person goes vegan, he decides for very good reasons why he or she doesn't want to consume any products where there, are, yeah, where there is meat in them, other animal products and so on. So if they are faced with the decision, should they eat a schnitzel or should they eat a salad or some other vegan alternative, they definitely don't even consider eating the schnitzel or other, some other meat-based product because it's, it's, it violates their principles. They, they wouldn't even consider it. The question is, can we have such strong principles in information security as well? And I can tell you from personal experience, I have such principles. I know many other developers who have similar principles. And one example that's, that's really easy to understand is using only encrypted communication pro uh, protocols. So whenever you are facing the decision, should I implement an encrypted protocol or an unencrypted communication protocol? Of course, it's, uh, you don't even consider the unencrypted protocol, except for some really rare edge cases. There might be some scenarios where you really have to say, okay, I 
there is no encrypted version of this protocol available. And there is for some obscure reason, it's not possible to wrap it in some encrypted channel. So I really have to use this unencrypted communication protocol. This should be the really rare occasion, usually wouldn't even consider this scenario. Analog with our vegan, uh, our vegan will not consider buying any product or eating any product where there are animal products in there. But let's say it's, it's a life and death situation. Our vegan strands on an uh, island and there is nothing to eat there. And the only way to survive is catching a kakadu, killing the kakadu, cooking the kakadu and eating the kakadu. Probably not much fun for the vegan person, but it's what's necessary to survive. In information security, it's usually not a life or death situation, but uh, we should approach it in a similar fashion. There might be those edge cases where we say, okay, we violate our principles, but this uh, should not predicate that we will violate them again in the future. Like our example, once the vegan person is able to leave the island, gets rescued, he will never uh, recon, or it's quite unlikely that he or she will reconsider if from now on, yeah, it's totally fine to consume meat. No, uh, if there is no necessity for this, uh, the decision is clear in the future. There will be uh, uh, no meat on the, on the plates and there will also in our case be no unencrypted protocols for uh, our architecture. And you can expand this to all the different security principles to make this more... Sp Thomas? The main idea is if you decide to make those principles or your, your own, you should be really convinced that those are the right principles. They should be ingrained in the back of your mind. You should think about them like the vegan thinks about eating meat. If that's your principle, you will make most or all decisions based on those principles. This also means on the flip side, you must be really careful about choosing the right principles for you. And you can even say, I have for different protection profiles, different design principles. For example, if I have an application that's really critical where a compromising of this application would lead to huge financial loss or would uh, have a negative impact for my organization. You can have really strict principles which uh, uh, might have some need additional resources for implementation and so on, but it's useful and it's necessary. And there might be some low protection profile application where you can have uh, ra rather lax uh, security principles that are easier to implement. So this decision has been made, but once it is made, uh, you should try to stick with your decisions. And to illustrate those points, what I have brought with me today are I think 12 or 13 different security design principles that are uh, quite common that are seen in literature quite often. And I want to, to explain how they should be thought about. Mm, but I also want to encourage you to think about your own specific design principles. There might be a lot of security design principles that are already natural for you, that work for you, that you are not potentially aware of that they actually are design principles. For example, only using encrypted protocols might be such a principle. Writing them down, giving proper uh, reasons why you should follow those principles and sharing this with your colleagues is a good first step to improve the security design principles in your organization. So let's take a look at the first one, defense in depth. Basically meaning whenever you think about a security mechanism, you should also consider what happens if the security mechanism fail. You should always have a second line of defense, maybe a third line of defense, maybe a fourth line of defense and so on, depending on the criticality of the functionality or the data you want to protect. I can give you an example from, real, uh, from the real world. I, have a, I own a dog, she's called Victoria. And Victoria is, um, when it go, for a walk with her, 
I definitely want to make sure that she's not running away. So the first control I have in place, I, I taught her some, some voice commands. I can make her sit, I can make her come back if I uh, utter the proper commands. Uh, and many times, most of the times, hopefully this works. But this is a security mechanism that breaks quite often. And uh, so to make sure that she doesn't run away, I need a second line of defense. So the obvious one is whenever I go out with her, I have her on a leash. So bad news is uh, Victoria doesn't like uh, explosions. Uh, that's especially bad nowadays, end of December, start of January, um, around uh, Sylvester parties. Many people, even during the days, tend to uh, fire off some fireworks, which are not to her likings. And uh, yeah, she, she tends to go into panic mode when, when a firework go, goes off. So there might be the possibility that uh, if a firework goes off, I don't, uh, I'm surprised myself don't have a good grasp on the leash and she's off by herself because I don't grasp the leash uh, good enough. So third line of defense, I take the leash and uh, tie it with a knot to my belt. Leash is rather stable, the belt is rather stable, so it's very, very unlikely that she can break out of this scenario. And even if she's of course, uh, like uh, the law, uh, um, tells us to do, she's also chipped. So she has a small little microchip under her skin that even if she gets lost and someone finds her, the vet can read out my data and know how to contact me. So the dog is returned safely to me and Victoria is back in her home. And uh, you can of course find many similar scenarios in your information systems, in your applications, where you have one security mechanism and you automatically think about what would happen if the security mechanism breaks. And each additional security mechanism makes such a scenario less likely that even if the first and the second mechanism breaks, there are still additional mechanisms that help you. So how many mechanisms do you need? Again, it depends a lot on your protection profile. So if you have a really high protection profile for your application, you will need more security mechanisms um, so that if, if the first, the second, and maybe even the third one fails, there is still security in place. There might be other application where this principle doesn't make sense for you where you say, well, if one security mechanism breaks and the application gets compromised, that's good enough. I don't want to spend the resources to make it really secure. Kind of secure is totally fine for this application. So you have to make this judgment for yourself, how many layers you want to implement. One thing that's important, you really should make sure that those different me mechanisms don't rely on each other. So for example, if the leash uh, breaks and I wouldn't have chipped the dog, but just have a, a capsule with my information, um, with my contact information on the leash and the part of the leash breaks in a way that this uh, information does not stick to the dog, I have a problem. So I have to consider such scenarios as well. The next one is open design, also known as no, obs no security by obscurity, also a well-known design principle, which basically says that you should not rely on hidden information in your application. This does not mean that you must make your application open source. That's totally your decision if you want to go this route or if you want to keep it closed source. But you should not have a real problem if your architecture gets, gets known, if your source code gets known. This, of course, does not apply to any cryptographic secrets, your keys, your passwords, and so on. Of course, they have to stay secret. But I'm more talking about stuff like hidden backdoors where there is a URL that's really complicated. But if you know it, you can access uh, some administrative functionality. Please never do this because the source code might leak, there might be a past disclosure somewhere, maybe uh, one of the developers leaves the, the organization and takes these securities with him and can exploit them later on. So it is fine to have some obscurity in addition to well-established security mechanisms. So if you have a well-hardened login interface and in addition, you uh, hide it from, from uh, the public by having a complex URL to access it. But even if 
this interface is uh, found, it is still secure. There's nothing wrong with having this additional barrier by making it hard to find. But uh, the moment where you rely on the attacker not finding some functionality, you're basically relying on luck. So basically that's a security design principle. This could also be worded like, don't implement security by luck because that's usually not the best idea. There's also the principle of general mistrust. General mistrust means that in information security, usually we have to assume that when we are communicating with external parties, we don't trust them in advance. So it doesn't matter if this is the, the, the typical client that we are facing, maybe some web browser and an end user that submits data, but also maybe some back end that we don't have full control over or where there are other applications who can inject data in those back ends. Whenever you are fetching data from a source that you do not fully trust, make sure to make uh, implement proper input validation and ensure that the rules are as strict as possible so it's really hard for a attacker to bypass it with some specific payload. Even if you're not really sure what you're protecting against, you don't even have to know all the different vulnerability classes. You just need to make the set of possible inputs as small as possible while still making sure that all the valid use cases go through can be quite difficult in, in practice, but if you're able to do this, uh, you are basically following the principle of general mistrust that you are not trusting the user input and making sure that whatever data you are working with um, follows those, basically follows the structure, the format that you are expecting to be secure. This means, for example, if you're working with something like an application level firewall, this can be a good additional security mechanism, but usually they don't really work out of the box because they are either really lax in the, in the sense that they don't uh, restrict the input well enough or they are over eager and restricted too much and therefore break, some, therefore break some of the functionality of the application. You really need to fine tune those mechanisms the same way you have to fine tune your application input validation mechanism. So in the end, it depends a little bit on the scenario, but I really don't care where you implement your, imp or your input validation mechanism, but you should make sure that they follow those principles. And I think the principle of general mistrust is a principle that you can follow quite easily in most scenarios. Least privilege uh, is, is uh, quite easy to understand. The name says it all. You want to make sure that your users and your services or whatever is able to perform actions on your systems only has the privileges that are required for the daily work. This can be easy in some scenarios. For example, I give a typical example that you should never, of course, browse the internet with administrative privileges because there can be drive-by attacks and so on. So you should only have minimal user rights when accessing the web. But there are way more complicated scenarios. When we're talking about secure software development, um, hardening a development environment can be is critical, but can be difficult because many developers need high privileges. They have to start different application servers and so on. And of course, there are scenarios how you can solve this. You can have specific areas with additional privileges. This can be containerized. There can be a system in place that temporarily allows uh, um, uh, a developer to get administrative privileges and so on. But you have to really think about how to implement this. And these mechanisms should be as easy to use as, as possible. Because the easier, and we will talk about similar principles uh, later on, the easier it is to make things right, the more likely it is that uh, no mistakes are made during configuration, during administration, and so on. So your goal is to minimize the 
damage that can be done by a malicious user or a user account that gets compromised. But you also have to consider that the less privileges a user has, the more difficult it is to, to actually do some tasks and it can be a burden in the daily business. And therefore you really have to make educated decisions, which privileges to remove, which to grant and to find a, a level of, of, of acceptable privileges that works from a security perspective, but doesn't limit the daily work, uh, or at least limit it as, as or hinder it at least little, little as possible. So that's the challenge. And if you go with the principle that you only want to have the least privilege possible, you should at least consider a little bit of, of leeway, especially in complex scenarios. And of course, also depending on the protection profile of the application. The more critical the application, the more you will have to invest in this area. Talking about privileges, there is also the principle of the separation of privileges. That's a rather advanced topic where we are talking about, we don't want to have a single person to be able to execute the critical function. For example, typical example is when you are working in the back end with a hardware security module or HSM. And for example, you want to back up the keys in this device, or you want to reset the device, or you want to do some specific critical action on this device. Usually you don't want to have a single person being able to do this on their own. So maybe you have different key cards for different administrators and uh, just pick some random number. You have seven administrators and at least three of them I don't care which three, but three of those seven have to be present with their key cards to perform this specific activity. And therefore you can be sure if this activity is taken, at least three of the seven administrators agree to this action. So that's one way to do it. There are different cryptographic, uh, cryptographic protocols that allow you to decrypt a message only if there is more than one key present. You can also have similar mechanisms like the one described before. Or you can implement something uh, on, on process level. For example, your system does not support this, but you want to have this. You can, for example, simply split the passphrase. So a privileged account can only be accessed via a password and the first half of the password, the first 10 characters, for example, are only known to person one and person two has the other half of the password and the account can only be accessed if both persons are present and typing in their part of the password. So you can basically uh, have a little makeshift separation of privilege uh, that you can build yourself. But how you actually implement this, again, depends on the circumstances, depends on the capabilities of the system, of course, and again, on the protection profile of the application and of the system itself. So if you decide to go this route, you should be really aware how burdensome this is in, in actual practice. You should only implement such mechanisms when it's really necessary for the really critical application parts. When you design such a, a principle for yourself, you should make sure that you know what's considered a critical operation so that it's easy for you to decide if you want to apply this to this operation or not. Usually interaction with cryptographic keys or stuff like this is considered critical. But again, it highly depends on your specific scenario. Yeah, economy of mechanism is one of those where I really don't like the name. It's also known as KISS, keep it small and simple. I, prefer this much more because it really tells you straight away it's not uh, it's really easy to understand what we mean when we keep it small and simple uh, and minimizing the attack surface is also quite um, telling it basically means we want to have applications that are easy to audit where the code is easy to read where this code base is small and uh, the application is, is simple and easy to understand. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm fighting with this myself from time to time. I really like to uh, code applications in Python, but I also have a background uh, coding a lot of Perl. And sometimes I code my Python applications like I used to code Perl in the past, meaning 
small set of characters, a lot of functionality, very hard to read. And yes, the applications often are way smaller than they should be, but definitely not simple. And I always have to remind myself of this principle and say, okay, this functionality can be written in four easily to read lines of code. You don't have to stuff everything in a single list comprehension, for example. So taking this step, step back and making sure to have it uh, I always think, will I understand this function if I read it in a month? And if I come to the conclusion that I don't understand my own code in a month, it's definitely worth refactoring. Talking about refactoring, following this principle sounds easy. So keep it small and simple. Everyone can do this. We don't implement functionality we don't need. We don't expose any functionality on the attack surface that we don't have to expose. Easy, right? So why we actually talk about it. Because over time, we usually tend to collect technical debt and uh, also security debt. This means that application that starts out rather small and simple, gets more and more complex. Uh, maybe we add some kind of prototype where the architecture isn't really streamlined and more complex than necessary. And we build on top of this. And after several weeks, months, and maybe years, we have application that's so overly complex that it's actually really hard to audit and violates everything within this principle. So we have to take this step back from time to time and consider refactoring the application, making sure it still follows our keep it small and simple principle because otherwise we might run into problems later on. Yeah, this also means including only those libraries and frameworks that you really need uh, during the last years, especially with JavaScript frameworks, it has become quite common that most of the application code we are running isn't actually our own, but some libraries we are including. Keeping our includes as small as possible is also a good idea to keep the code base small. I know that's not always easy in practice, but that's at least something we should strive for. Another one with a way too complex name, least common mechanism. I prefer to call it simply isolation. And the idea is to separate different uh, information paths and different shared resources when it makes sense. A uh, typical example of this is multi-tenancy. When you have different tenants in your application, you have to consider what happens if one tenant gets compromised. Do you want uh, or how much effect on other tenants is acceptable? You can have very, very strict isolation. You can say different tenants have to be stored in different data centers. So you have a physical separation, isolation in this case. You can say, okay, same data center is okay, but we want to have different hardware. We want to have different network access. Maybe we have uh, same network, but still different hardware. Maybe we have all tenants on the same hardware but there is at least uh, virtualization, there is some um, uh, container environment or okay, they're all in the same host, but we separate them on database level. Database level again can mean uh, we separate them, we have them in distinct databases or we have them in the same database, but these different schemas and so on. You can uh, think about different possible scenarios. In the end, the sooner or the more strict you isolate, the more expensive resource wise it will be, but also the more secure it will be. So if you follow the design principle of isolation, I would highly recommend to clearly define what you mean by isolation. On which level do you want to isolate? And again, this can differ between different protection profiles. There might be high critical applications where we really want to separate the applications and the different tenants on hardware level. And there might actually be a scenario where it's totally fine to have every tenant uh, in the same database at long, at, as long as they are running in different schemas. So you will do some kind of threat analysis and have some risk analysis and you see what's the potential impact and the losses and what effort you would require to harden uh, or to isolate those uh, components and can make a sound decision where to invest and how strong you want to isolate. This also applies to sandbox environments. I also like the idea to separate endpoints and log in uh, 
systems for administrative and normal users. That's a quite old uh, implementation. The, 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 the earliest thing I have seen, I think, was Typo 3 over 15 years ago, where they had their front end users log in on a separate endpoint and the administrative users on another endpoint. So even if the admin credentials leak somehow, the, uh, the, the, the attacker cannot log in with those credentials on the front end. He has to log in on the back end, and you can place additional security mechanisms on the back end. For example, some network protection that only specific IP addresses from known administrators can access those interfaces, and so on. So you have the possibility to harden parts of the application that are more critical, and you can attain this through those isolation mechanisms. Complete mediation also, unfortunately, one of those I don't like the name, but I haven't really come across a, a, a easier to grasp name that, that basically describes the same concept so far. The idea behind complete mediation is that whenever you have some kind of authorization process, you want to have the authentication authorization on all necessary levels. So one example, like you can see in the picture on the right side, you let's take a concrete example. Let's say there is a CRM system and you have some uh, member managers um, in this application and those member managers can get data from their members, from their clients, they can update these objects and they can, let's say, delete those objects. So the first thing to check if someone wants to access this data is the URL, is the user authenticated for this URL? And if you're not part of this uh, member manager group, you probably shouldn't even access the functionality at this URL. So you will be blocked by the web server even before the script gets executed. So even if there is a vulnerability in the script, you can't trigger the scripts, you can't uh, trigger the vulnerability in there. So let's say you are part of this group and you actually can access these scripts. The script might have a functionality for getting the data, updating the data, or deleting the data, and so on. But you're only allowed, you have low privileges, you're only allowed to read data from certain objects. So the next check would be, can you access the functionality of get data? Yes, you can. Do you want to delete the data? The application will, so you, will say you don't have the privileges for this. And again, if you have the privileges to read data, you might not be allowed to read all the objects. There might be some clients you don't, maybe some VIP clients where you shouldn't get access to. So you can have fine-grained access control on object level and say, read access for this user or for this role should only be possible um, or should be possible or should not be possible and make security decisions on on this level. So you can do this on server uh, side, you can do this directly in the backend, depending on your application architecture and so on. But the main idea of complete mediation is checking all the necessary authentication uh, privileges uh, in the different, on the different levels. In addition, you also should make sure that it's checked every time. So you are allowed to have some, some caching of permissions but if that's the case you also must be able to force updates on those caches so if the administrator decides to remove a role from a user or change the access rights the user sh this should get into effect right away so you should be able to force updates on this cache to really make sure that yeah the, the changes are in effect right away and the uh, affected user cannot use his old privileges until he's locked out, for example. Secure the weakest link, also a very important one. Whenever you have the chance to invest in your information security, hardening your application, what you want to do is spend the resources where they are suited best. And what do I mean by this? You should identify where is your weakest link. And 
put yourself in the shoes of the attacker. If you were the attacker, where would you attack the application? What would be the most likely place where you would be successful? And this is most likely also your weakest link. So try to identify this area and try to harden this area specifically. I know in practice, it can be tempting to invest in those areas where you're very familiar. So let's say you already built a very complex authentication mechanism, but that it's working really well and you know of some quirks in there but you really want to get rid of these quirks and you get some resources to work on the security of the application and you're really tempted to work on your baby where you are really familiar, where you really know the application and want to remove those last quirks. Also, in reality, those quirks will never be exploited because it's way too complicated for an attacker. While you might have much uh, more important things to work on. Maybe your input validation is weak or you have some other issues in the application. So if you're doing this right, the weakest link will be a moving target because once you have worked on your weakest link and making make and made it resilient and uh, secure against attacks, there will be another weakest link. So what was before the second weakest link will now become the weakest link. And you can do this over and over again until you reach a level where your weakest link is so strong that most of the attackers will not even attempt to really attack it in depth because uh, yeah, this would be really complicated. So that's your goal, making your application as secure as possible. And the easiest way to do this is focusing on your weakest link. In this specific scenario, that's a security design principle that's really hard to argue with. So I would really highly recommend to adapt this. Fail safe, also very important one. We often can anticipate failure in our applications. We have exception management, for example, in, in Java. So we know of certain, ex certain exceptions that can, can arise and we can deal with them in the code. But we should also have some kind of last resort exception handler that makes sure that if something unexpected, really unexpected happens, that the application falls back into a secure state. Because what our hacker doing, they often try to bring the application in a insecure state so they can do or perform operations they actually shouldn't do. I think one of the most strict uh, implementations of this would be whenever you encounter an unexpected error, an unexpected exception, what you should do is log out the affected user, which can be quite a nuisance if your application is not really well designed and might have some other problems, not even security related, that lead to regular logout of your valid users. This is something you definitely do not want to have. But I can also tell you from the attacker's perspective, when I'm doing penetration tests and encounter such mechanisms, it's really, really difficult to break into such a system because everything you try, every exception you raised, you will be locked out again and you have to spend some time to log in again and to recreate the state you had before. And this takes a lot of your time and it makes it really difficult to, to perform proper attacks. So it's a good mechanism against attackers, but it can also backfire from a availability perspective if you have some other issues that might trigger this behavior. There are, of course, less... Um, implementations controls with less impact. Again, you have to evaluate for your specific scenarios, which is the right way to go. But you should definitely make sure that an unexpected exception or error does not lead to information disclosure or brings the application in a state that's vulnerable to attack. Psychological acceptability is also really, really important. That's a name I can live with that's easy to understand. Make your implementer security controls in a way that makes them easy to use, have good user experience, everything else is definitely doomed to fail. You might know this from, from uh, real world scenarios. If you have a secure area in your organization and usually the kitchen is outside of the secure area, and yeah, I noticed myself, uh, security doors are heavy and you usually have to provide some fingerprint or some kind of token or whatever authentication mechanism to get into the secure area. You often have more than one beverage in hand or have to, yeah, want to transport more than you can easily transport. 
and there's this heavy door and you have to authenticate and you have to go several times and you are really, really tempted to just spread open the door for several minutes to get all your stuff out and, and maybe even forget about that you spread the door open, basically totally invalidating the security mechanism and opening the door quite literally for attackers to enter the secure area. It's the same with uh, security controls in our applications. If you make it really hard to use secure passwords, for example, I've seen this in uh, several applications where they don't allow you to copy paste passwords for security reasons, but you can't use your password uh, stores uh, like KeePass or things like this anymore. So you really have to type in your password anytime and can't use your secure password storage. I know there are different opinions about those password storage, but my personal opinion is they're quite useful and quite helpful to use strong passwords and different passwords in all the applications. So preventing copy paste from such stores isn't the best idea because it tends to force people to use weaker passwords overall. And that's definitely not what is the goal of the security control. So really consider how such mechanisms impact the user experience of your users. It's also helpful to have some, some indications about the strengths of a password. Of course, you can write down all the different rules for your password policy, but it's way easier to, to make those rules as simple as possible, show the user how strong the password he already chose is, and uh, telling him, well, you're already in the yellow area, that's good enough, but we recommend to add some characters so that you get in the green area, with every character the bar rises and there might be even some helpful tips that can even improve the password strengths as well. So users will have an incentive to be proud about having a green password and making the password even more complex than the baseline would require them to. Also, you should always provide secure defaults. It should not be the task of the user, especially if it's an end user who gets a new account to harden his account or his configuration for his application but you should roll it out with secure defaults, which should already be quite usable. But if there is some hindrance, if it's, um, yeah, if there are some impacts on user experience, those secure defaults can be weakened. The user has the ability to do so, but only after accepting a warning that security gets compromised by those changes. So it's not that the user has actively to do something to make the application secu secure, but if he wants to, make it less secure, he has to go through this warning process and has, it must be obvious to him or her what he or she is doing. Eliminating the root causes, also quite crucial, don't fix stuff somewhere else. So if you have a problem with SQL injection, I know SQL injection is a vulnerability class that's mostly eradicated maybe not totally eradicated, but modern programming environments make it quite easy to implement applications that are not prone to SQL injection. But nevertheless, if you have such a problem, don't fix the problem with input validation or some other external mechanism, basically hiding the SQL problem, but make sure that the actual implementation where your SQL commands are created are implemented with secure frameworks, with secure mechanisms and so on. So basically eradicating this root cause helps you that even if the application gets refactored in the future, new functionality gets implemented, you can be sure that SQL injection is a problem of the past if you design your architecture in a way that this root cause can't be uh, exploited anymore. This should also be part of a good security defect lifecycle. So whenever you identify a new vulnerability, don't think about how can I patch this, but how can I really eliminate this problem at the root? This should be a way of thinking. This should be your principle if you're following this uh, the security design principle. And again, that's one of those principles I really, really highly recommend to follow. And last, but definitely not least, leverage existing components. I highly recommend that you build a central security framework for your development projects where you can collect all the different security controls you have developed. And the main idea is that you, on the first, uh, on the one hand, you should not reinvent the wheel. So if there is established security controls out there that you can use, evaluate if they are suitable for you and use them. Uh, include them in your framework so that you can easily access them in the future for other projects. And if there is really a 
those are actually quite rare scenarios. Most of the security problems we are facing are actually solved out there. There are established patterns and so on that can be used for many different programming environments. So if you are really forced to implement your own security controls, implement them properly, test them properly, make really sure that they do what they are supposed to do, that they are really as secure as you uh, as you hope they are. And once you have established them as your best practice, also include them in your framework for other projects to use. The idea is invest once properly and uh, reap the benefits time and time again in future development projects. I don't care if those are infrastructure components, if these are dedicated services, if that's part of a framework, if there's a library, maybe some specific helper functions, whatever, it depends on the use case. But the idea is reuse what you have built well. And this can also help you to reduce your security costs because reinventing the wheel, rebuilding established security mechan mechanisms time and time again will also lead to repeating failures from the past and making the same mistakes other people have already made and eradicated uh, from their functionalities. So yeah, use those existing components wisely and make sure to have a framework that helps you develop your applications in a secure fashion. So that's all the principles I brought along with me. There are of course many others. As I said initially, you should also think about, should think outside the box, should think about other security principles that are really important for you. You can show some of those where you say, yeah, I really want to follow these ones, formulate them in a fashion that works for you. Think about your own specific design principles and really make them your basis for decision in a way that you don't really have to make a decision, but the decision is clear in most cases how to approach a specific problem. Recommended reading in the end. Uh, I really like the document OWASP-SAM, the security, uh, Secure Application Maturity Model. It's basically a framework that allows you to measure your the maturity of your software development processes. It's from OWASP. It's uh, free to download. I wrote a little article for Heise. It's a German article. So for our German viewers, uh, you find the URL on the right side on the top. Uh, highly recommended to check it out if you don't know about OWASP SAM. It's a good introduction. I'm also writing a deep dive series about secure software development uh, based on OWASP SAM. You can find this on the right side in the middle. And if you want to follow me on Twitter to get updates about different information security topics. topics. My handle is at Dementophobia. I'm also glad for everyone who wants to follow me there. We already talked about sec for dev uh, highly recommend uh, visiting this great conference. I've been there last year, really enjoyed it. Many great talks. I will be talking on the 24th of February this year and uh, quite likely will also be talking to some of the colleagues during the breakout sessions. So definitely check this out as well. And yeah, here we are at the end, uh, almost seven o'clock here. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, or maybe we already have some in the Q&A section. I didn't check it, to be honest, during the presentation. So Thomas, do we have anything we want to discuss? Uh, there are no questions so far in the Q&A section, but um... I got asked a few questions via the chat or uh, I saw them. I'm, I'm just going to ask them again, maybe. Uh, so the first question would be, uh, you mentioned fail safe. There's also a principle that's called, called fail secure. Uh, or was it the other way around? Now, what is, are they a contradiction? Are they, do they say the same thing? What's the difference between fail safe and fail secure? So wording is always one of the reasons why security design principles are a little mysterious because uh, different organizations call them a different way. There might be a slight distinction. I honestly have heard both, but I'm, I don't think there is actually a distinction. So fail safe or safe secure uh, or fail secure means the same thing. What's important here is that secure or safe doesn't always mean the same thing. There is, uh, it, depends on what you want to protect. If you want to protect the availability of the system, you definitely don't want to risk uh, 
any kind of shutdown or you don't want to risk that exception leads to a decrease of availability, of course. On the other hand, if you say you don't care about the availability that much, but you're really concerned about confidentiality and integrity, it might be a better to solution to say in some rare exceptions where we really assume something bad happened, we simply shut down the application because we can't risk uh, a real compromise and availability isn't so critical. So deciding if you want to go the, the fail open or fail close scenario is, is very important. I think one of the most common examples of this is from the network level where we had uh, in the past, uh, if, if a routing table overflowed, you had the scenario, well, the routing table is overflowing. What should I do? Uh, I can't route the packets anymore. And several routers decided to basically fail open and say, we want to have an available network. So we basically broadcast everything, which uh, led to different types of attacks where you can sniff the network and so on. So uh, basically aiming for high availability led to, yeah, less security concerning integrity and, uh, integrity and confidentiality. But it was a design decision the only alternative would be to say, okay, I can't root anymore. So I basically shut down or I wait until my table is, is flushed and, and I can root again. But that's a decision depending highly on the specific use cases. Yeah, also one example that comes to my mind is uh, that if you have a door with an electric door lock and, and servers inside, uh, what happens if uh, there's a fire and uh, there's no electricity? Are you going to open the door or are you going to close it? So opening the door would be fail safe. People and, and their health and their lives are uh, protected if they can at least leave the room when there's fire in there and fail secure would be the opposite, which would not probably be the, I don't know, you know, it depends on, on the real case that we're talking about. Uh, another question was about uh, complete mediation. And I think there was some, uh, also maybe some misunderstanding. It's a, it's a term that's hard to understand. I always understand uh, access control at every request. That's what I understand behind it. There was a question, is that the same as a zero trust architecture? I would say no. A zero trust architecture usually means in my understanding that you have an assumed breach scenario. So zero trust means that your application is secure even in scenarios where, for example, when we are talking about the network level, I cannot rely on my parameter security. So I have to assume a parameter is breached and I don't assume that uh, specific interfaces can't be accessed, for example. Uh, that's one of the, of the typical zero trust scenarios and you can assume different breaches at different levels and, and so on. Uh, I agree with you, uh, complete mediation is, there are also, different definitions in different standards actually. And uh, what you mentioned was uh, the second case, what I meant you have to make sure that every request gets authenticated. And if you do some changes and have some caches, you have to flush them and so on. But again, uh, my recommend, recommendation would be to don't say I do complete mediation. The best approach would be to completely forget the term complete mediation, but really think about what you want to, to implement and uh, checking authentication or authorization with every request is quite a good idea to do. So you should do this and actually don't really care if it's called complete mediation or something else, because those terms often lead to more mysticism that's actually necessary, yeah. Mm -hmm. There was also one question regarding uh, books and literature. Is there any literature out there that you can recommend where these things are maybe covered in, uh, from other angles or in more detail? It highly depends on, on which topic you mean specifically when we're talking about security design principles and uh, it's also closely related to security design patterns. What I would recommend to check out is the OWASP cheat sheet series. It's a compendium of, of different security design patterns. I, I would say several dozens, uh, dozens of different, uh, different uh, 
patterns you can implement, some of them already with source code, samples attached, some just more general, but that's something that's really worth checking out. And whenever I'm encountering a, a new security problem, the first approach usually is checking out the, the OWASP cheat sheets, looking if there are some recommended patterns to implement and to, yeah, check out if there's already some some established pattern that I can use or adapt for my situation or if I really have to to think about something myself. So that's probably one of the the better sources if you're looking for security design patterns that follow those security design principles. Mm -hmm. Uh, one book that I haven't read completely, but there are some aspects in there that go in that direction, I think is, and was mentioned by one of the participants as well in the chat, is uh, Building Secure and Reliable Systems, published via O'Reilly. One term I like particularly in there is the, this, the distinction of uh, initial velocity uh, compares to, to sustained velocity. So if I make wrong design decisions and I take the wrong design principles in the beginning when I design and, ar and architect the system, uh, that might give me some initial speed and maybe got, ma might get me uh, get the product out earlier. But then uh, it will definitely set me back later on when I when I you know notice that there are security problems in the product, and when I have to. It's like changing the wall when the house is already built. That's way more expensive than thinking about how I'm going to build it so that it's solid before I start building. So that's maybe something that uh, that could be a literature that, that goes in that direction. There's a question by Marco in the questions and answers section. He's asking, how can we encrypt and decrypt with multiple keys for the separation of privilege? Not sure how exactly he means that question. So there are, there's again the makeshift approach where you can simply split a key into, into several, several files and you have a wrapper that actually requires you to reassemble the key on a especially hardened system or that allows you to decrypt it. That would be a yeah, makeshift approach. But there are also some specific uh, cryptographic protocols where you can actually do something like you need uh, three out of five keys, for example. I can't name them off the, at the top of my head, but there are some protocols out there that, uh, that are available that actually implement this functionality. But if you want to, to have the, the makeshift approach, which I don't really recommend, you can also just split a specific key file and uh, distribute it uh, to your recipients. In this case, you really need all of them. So if you split it in three parts, all three parts need to come together again, but there are actually protocols out there that really allow you to have a three out of five, for example, scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another question by Roman. What's your take on security API architecture with trust by chained hashes per request, somewhat similar to blockchain or perfect so forward secrecy? too much acronyms. Uh, <laughs> maybe you can answer this. Uh, I haven't come across such a specific application. I Neither do I mean uh, know exactly what Roman means by that question. Uh, archi uh, API architecture with trust by chained hashes per request. Maybe you can, Roman, maybe uh, you can t put another take in there and, and make it more uh, more specific. We both don't really know what you mean by this. Sorry for that. Um, and so I think we are we are through with the with the questions answered. Maybe if Roman gets back with another question, we can answer it afterwards. Uh, but now for those who are still here and bared with us, there is, uh, like you said, you have each request authenticated. Maybe Roman, um, you can also speak. You can raise your hand later, and you can speak and, and maybe ask us directly. That would maybe let's make a conversation out of this. But first. We're gonna give away the free ticket for the sec for dev conference because that's what many people are waiting yes. for, I guess. Nikki, exactly. I'm do your thing. Ready. 